distinct pleasure today of introducing our speaker, Mr. Chip Tanzel, who is the director of the Ohio Department of Veterans Services. And in this position, he's responsible for identifying, connecting, and advocating for veterans and their families. I have one advantage on him because uh, back in uh, 2008, I was around when we had this governor and a few things that started out in this bill number 289 for veterans and their families. And uh, 289 was passed. It gives this department the responsibility to work with and coordinate activities of the county veterans service officers, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, better known as the VA, as well as other various statewide veterans and other concerned organizations of which I happen to serve on the foundation of the Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame as one of them. As director of this important state of Ohio department, he's a member of Governor Kasich's cabinet, and I'm sure he's going to be able to share some of his information and uh, what's going on in the state with veterans today. So, uh, Chip, if you'll please come forward here. Without further discussion, because I know uh, we're cutting you short here, I'd like to introduce uh, and welcome Mr. Chip Tanzel. I must start off with I'm very tired today because I spent the last four days in Kansas City where my daughter gave me my first grandchild. And I'm hoping for many more. I just, um, I hope I don't have to pay for them all. Next slide, please. <laughs> So our department, again, thanks Jack, uh, created in 2008. Before that, it was the Governor's Office of Veterans Affairs, now the uh, Veterans Services. Now, why is this significant? Because it was elevated to a cabinet agency, gave us authority and some other things to work across the state. And I'm gonna try to keep it down to five slides. I was gonna play a joke on you and tell you I had about 50 slides, but since I've already told you I'm running out of time, uh, we'll keep it short. I wanna talk really quickly. One of the things we decided to do was uh, Anytime you work in government, and most, and most of you know this, um, somebody likes you and somebody hates you. So we work very hard, and one of the things we wanted to do was become a trusted voice for veterans. You notice when Jack introduced me, it says I advocate for. I, I continuously tell people that I work for the governor, but I advocate for veterans. And, and that's very difficult sometimes for people to understand because they think I work directly for the veteran, and I don't, I advocate for those folks. Uh, because there's so much going on in the government space for veterans, whether it's, whether it's county, whether it's state, or whether it's federal. So we work very hard with those other partners. Uh, we have a great mission, and I'm uh, happy to say, you know, we have about 800,000 veterans in the state of Ohio, and uh, of, of those, 284,000 are Vietnam veterans. And most people don't know that. We have a tremendous amount of Vietnam veterans here in our state. But the one, uh, the jewel of what we do is we have two veterans homes, and most people don't know that either. One of them dates back to the Civil War, and that's in Sandusky, and that's this beautiful picture right here with the, with the water out front of it. There we have about 650 veterans uh, that stay there. It's the second largest uh, nursing home um, in the country. So it's quite unique. It's still, uh, we've renovated it quite a bit, so it doesn't look quite look like it did back when Jack was still serving uh, at the end of the Civil War. Um, so it looks a little bit better than that. The other one, uh, they opened up in 2003 down in Georgetown, and this is the majestic country setting with the rocking chairs on the front porch uh, and the cannon out front, and it holds about 150 people. It's quite unique. Uh, we pride ourselves on taking great care of our veterans. Most veterans, most of these 800,000 veterans, don't even know we have these two homes. And that's a shame because many of our veterans, their families can't keep them at home because they're ill, nor can they pay to put them in a facility. And to be honest with you, most of our veterans that stay with us, the VA, because they're VA service connected, the VA pays a significant portion of uh, what it costs to keep them there. Our department's quite, uh, everybody says we're really small because we only have about 30 people in Columbus, but we're about 1,000 people um, across the state, so we're pretty fortunate as a mid-sized uh, uh, agency that we get to help quite a few veterans. Next slide, please. So our, our department's broke down quite unique. Um, we reorganized, uh, I t I've been in the job just a little over three years and we reorganized when I got there. And I'll tell you why here in just a minute. But these are basically the, the five major branches of what we do. And I'll get a little bit more specific about a couple of those uh, here in just a second. But um, let's just go, into the, go to the next slide because that one's uh, quite lengthy. So this is, this is one of the things the governor told us we had to do when I took over in September of 2015. He said to me, he goes, how many people come back to Ohio every year? 
How many veterans leave the active component alone and come back to Ohio? Anybody have an idea? 10,000. That's just the ones we know of because they have the choice not to let us know they're coming back. Now, Ohio is such a great place to live that I think everybody would let us know they're coming back here, especially when they get here and need connected services. Because what happens is uh, when you go through transitioning out of the military, no one really pays attention to that because your brain is already on what you're going to do when you get home. So we're here to help them. So as you can see the statistics here, 450,000 veterans are in the labor force. Uh, just a few short years ago, it was double-digit unemployment in Ohio for veterans. Double-digit unemployment in Ohio for veterans. And uh, that was excruciatingly uh, painful for me when the governor told me that. Uh, and I will tell you, we have worked very hard. Now, we don't get a veteran a job in our department. That's Job and Family Services, and that's all the other agencies. What we try to figure out in Ohio is how do we get um, employers to understand what's great about veterans? Now, here's why that, that's important. Because many of you in here run businesses. And I can tell you many CEOs and presidents over my three years have come to me and said, I want to hire veterans. If you bring me 40 today, I'll hire them today. I want to hire veterans. Now, we'll get into the reasons why they want to hire veterans, but what we found is, is the businesses couldn't figure out where the veterans are. Couldn't figure out how to hire them. Couldn't figure out what their skill sets were. So we spent a lot of time figuring out what we could do. So what we ended up doing is I reorganized our department and we got workforce liaisons in there who don't work with they don't work with the uh, veteran themselves, they work with the president or CEO or hiring managers of a company to connect those folks. So now we go out and give uh, um, the human resource folks and the hiring managers lingo on how to understand us because everybody who's a veteran in here knows we use this thing called acronyms and, and we're horrible about it. I, I can remember about two years ago I got a resume from a young man and in the first sentence there were only three non-acronym military words, three, out of about 12 words. Now, I understood everything he said. It was perfect, perfectly clear to me. But can you imagine being a hiring manager who never served in the United States military and getting a resume where all the person did was use acronyms and military pieces of equipment? Do you know what happens to that resume? It goes on the bottom of the pile. But some of the best Americans are our veterans because they've had some great experiences. So now I want to get into why we do what we do. Why did we decide to go help president, CEOs, hiring managers, and HR folks understand veterans? Well, because we have a lot of the skill sets that they're looking for. We can work independently. We can also work as part of a team. We pick up things very well. We're very loyal. We show up to work on time. We stay till the end of the day. And you know what the most important, number one thing business owners tell me? Why they want to hire veterans? Anybody have any idea? We know how to work. We can pass a drug test. <clears throat> now, isn't, no, no, we know we have a drug problem in Ohio. The whole country has a drug problem. But business owners want to hire veterans because they know we'll pass a drug test. And they'll teach us whatever we need to know because why, veterans learn very quickly. Now, I will tell you, it's a challenge sometimes because people like Mike Carroll and I, who retire as colonels, Air Force, Army, go Army. Um, I love the Air Force. Love them. They uh, won the Desert Storm War Force. Uh, I will tell you that um, we come out of the military as colonels and we think we ought to be the CEO of a company. Many veterans believe that. Or, hey, I was in charge of 11 people, everything about them, I kept them alive, so I, I should be, you know, some HR director or something like that. So we have to teach veterans to accept reality. They didn't go into the military as a sergeant major or a colonel. They went in as a private or a lieutenant. So we try to get them to understand when they come out and go to a business, maybe one of your businesses, that they understand they have to work their way back up. If they were that successful in the military, they're going to be that successful in a civilian job. We work very hard to get them to understand that, and it's uh, quite unique. Now, the veteran unemployment in Ohio right now is about 3.7%. It's lower than Ohio's unemployment. We're very happy with that, but you know what? We'll never take our eye off that ball. Because earlier I said 10,000 veterans come home every year. We take our eye off that ball just one year, just one year, and that number is going to start skyrocketing. You know, the other thing about veterans is uh, we, um, we tend to come back to where we, where we came from. So when we get out of the military, we go home. We're working very hard with DOD, VA, and Department of Labor. I spend a lot of time in D.C. because we think, I get a little bit of time, we think that we need to have access to those people before they ever take their uniform off. Because if you're a welder and you go to whatever town in Ohio that has no jobs welding, you've just hurt yourself and your family. So we're trying to get, a, get to those folks ahead of time so we can talk to them and say, oh, you're a welder? Here are the top ten places in Ohio you can move to and get a welding job. Better yet, here's a website with all those jobs listed on it so you can apply before you ever get here. 
There's one great company, and I won't mention their name. They hire people over, they hire military officers over Skype to be in, um, in the management training program without ever looking at them face to face. They do that because they trust the veterans are going to be a good worker within their organization. So they Skype with them, they do all the interviews that way, hire them. When they get out of uniform, they show up their training program. To my knowledge, that, that company's been very successful at that. Next slide, please. So how do we know that employers want to hire, hire veterans? So, so Melanie sits over here. She's our communications director. And um, we've logged a lot of windshield time over the last three years, her, her and the previous communications directors, because we visit businesses, we visit college campuses. And if someone asks us to come and do a presentation of some sort, we do, whether it's presenting coins or Vietnam lapel pins. We go everywhere across the state. And I will tell you, we do that for one reason. Our veterans live everywhere across the state. They just don't live in Columbus. They just don't live in Cleveland. They just don't live in Cincinnati. They live everywhere. So we want to make sure that businesses everywhere um, have access to our veterans. Uh, uh, electrical business in Marysville said to me, he's the guy that said, I want to hire 40 veterans. Bring them today. I'll hire them all. Well, unfortunately, I couldn't find 40 unemployed veterans in Marysville, right, because unemployment's so low. Now we're in another challenge. Unemployment's getting so low that the employers are starting to suffer to get employees in. So we work with employees every day. We go out and celebrate with those employers who hire veterans. That's twofold. One, we get to go out, pat them on the back, and thank them and give them a coin. And they get a little bit of attention out of this because we post everything on Facebook. Sometimes we get media. We bring local legislators. And then guess what? That business is now held up for being a veteran-friendly business. We love doing that because it's a win for everyone, especially the veteran. So I love going out and I love visiting as many businesses as I can. Small, large, doesn't matter. We'll do whatever we can. I, uh, I, I want to close and then I'll open up for a couple of questions. Um, we have this thing called the Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame. And we have a, a person sitting right here who is a member of that Hall of Fame. So the Hall of Fame has 26 previous uh, inductee, inductee classes with names like um, John Glenn and uh, Neil Armstrong and everybody else in Ohio who's done wonderful work since they've gotten out of the military. So starting uh, Wednesday night we have a banquet and on Thursday we'll induct 20 new Ohioans for the work they've done here. Our Hall of Fame is not about your military career. Actually being in the military only gets you qualified to go into the Hall of Fame. What gets you into the Hall of Fame is your community service once you got out of the military. And I will tell you, if you uh, have an opportunity to Google on OhioVets.gov and look at some of the names of those folks that are in our Hall of Fame, you're going to be amazed. Now, I will tell you, just last year I had the, the uh, privilege of inducting a current sitting Navy SEAL. And this Navy SEAL, by the way, he's still on active duty, and he um, was a Medal of Honor recipient. And it was just amazing to talk to him. Of course, he can't only say so much because, right, he's still a sitting Navy SEAL and he can't talk about his missions. But our Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame recognizes 20 people every year, and we're going to continue to do it for as long as we can. And a banquet is Wednesday night, Thursday is an induction, and then we uh, hang a plaque in the spring on the wall inside the Rife in the Veterans, uh, Veterans Plaza there. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing event. And I would recommend, the reason why I bring it up to you all is because everyone in here Everyone in here who's not a veteran knows a veteran. And everyone in here who knows a veteran knows someone in the community that's doing an outstanding job. It, it, it doesn't matter what they're doing. It matters that they're giving back to their community. So it, they can be a politician. They can be a Boy Scout troop leader. They can be a baseball coach. It's what they give back to their community. Now, I will tell you that if, last year we had 130 applicants and only 20 got in. It's probably one of the tougher years we had in just selecting 20. But if you know a great veteran out there who's doing wonderful work, whether it's sitting right here in this room on, uh, in this organization or within the community dealing with other folks, I would suggest you get on our, on our website. Look up OhioVets.gov. Think about nominating these vets to go into our Hall of Fame. Uh, it's a privilege to talk to you today. I'm really passionate about my job. Uh, we work tirelessly. M Melanie never lets me take a break. And um, yeah, this week's a busy week. I think we have about 10 events to go to. So. Um, I really appreciate your attention, and if anybody has any questions for me, I would uh, be honored to take them. Yes, sir. You, you talked about the challenges of getting them through hiring uh, the veterans, but I've heard from other advocate groups, hiring them, them itself is not just the end goal. You have to know who you're hiring. 
do you work with that as well? I mean, here you've got a group of people who may have other emotional issues and other things that need support. Yeah, um, I will tell you, we, we do a lot of things when we educate the employer because every, um, uh, every veteran does not have post-traumatic stress. Unfortunately, um, you, you, people think that because they think we all have post-traumatic stress. What I will tell you is more non-veterans have post-traumatic stress than do veterans. Because post-traumatic stress is not tied to war, it's tied to a traumatic event, like the loss of a child, like a car accident, like a house fire, like a robbery. Those things cause post-traumatic stress, not just being at war. So we educate the employers. Actually, uh, Mike did a little work here a couple of years back that had me thinking that, and he prompted us to have that conversation with employers because they asked that question. I actually had an employer say to me, you know, I'd like to hire 40 vets, but you all have PTS. And I said, no, sir, you're, you're wrong. And I said, we could probably go around this room right here, and we could probably just have a small handful of post folks with post-traumatic stress, and none of them will be veterans. So we educate the employer on that. We educate them what to look for. We, we educate them on, okay, if you're worried about post-traumatic stress, here's some of the things that you might want to look for. And I got to be honest with you, I, I think that we've gotten past that point, thank goodness, to where everyone understands that just because you serve does not mean you have post-traumatic stress. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk a little bit about the disadvantages of hiring or what about the turnover of veterans? Okay, that's a great question. Um, here's what I would tell you. The good, greatness. Uh, the question was, uh, can, uh, can I talk about any of the disadvantage of hiring a veteran like turnover? Uh, here's something I learned, uh, specifically about senior officers like myself and Mike Carroll. Someone told me one day that senior officers typically have three jobs before they stop and, and stay with that job. Uh, because we come out, we get a transition job, and that's just to get food on the table for our family. And then we go to another job because we are, are usually underemployed at that point. So we take another job, and then finally we land at a third job that we stay at forever. That's typically for senior military folks that do that because they have so much experience. Um, the average uh, veteran, because they're so loyal and because they work well with teams, if they like the company they work for, they typically stay. But they're just like anyone else. If they don't like the company they work for, they're not treated appropriately. Uh, they will move on to another job. We also recommend that when, if a, if a company wants to hire a lot of veterans, we talk to them about starting a veteran, veteran employee resource group at Verge. And that's where the vets can get together and talk, uh, you know, if they may be on different shifts, they may be in different plants, but they can get together and work together, talk about things, talk with the leadership of the company. And usually the companies that start that veteran employee resource group have less turnover than those who do not. Yes, sir. A few years ago, there was a lot of uh, difficulty for veterans coming out uh, that required licensure, like truck drivers, medics, et cetera. What's going on in that area now? Is there still difficulty? No, there is not difficulty. Uh, so a couple of years back, I want to say 2011 or 12, I, don't quote me on that, uh, the, the, the governor pushed, the legislature passed uh, bills to make licensure much faster. Veterans go to the front of the line. In some cases, fees are waived. Uh, so they can get their license much, much faster. He made the comment one day, and I wasn't in the job at that point, if we can have a truck driver in the Army drive from uh, one city in Afghanistan to another city in Afghanistan, why can't we let him drive from Columbus to Cleveland without making them jump through a bunch of hoops? So that's why that legislation was passed. They, they work with everyone. Now, everybody has to get the license, but how you get it um, and how long it takes you to get it is much, much faster. The veterans and spouses get to go to the front of that line. Thank you, sir. And, yes, sir. You see a lot of homeless vets on the streets. Do you have any programs which are addressing that particular problem? So we are not duplicating what the VA does. The VA has a great, great program. In Ohio right now, there are less than 1,000 homeless veterans. And in the last count I had, less than 10 of those were unsheltered. The about, so about 950 of those were considered homeless but sheltered. They weren't living on the street. So that number is pretty significant, significantly low compared to other states. Typically what we find is they, they're couch surfing. Uh, but there are a lot less today than there have been in the past. I, I will tell you, just three short years ago, that number was much, much higher. So it's, it was about 962 a few months back, and only a handful of those were unsheltered actually living on the street. And some of those chose to live that way because they did not want to be sheltered. But we don't duplicate that program because the VA has a great program. It's a wonderful program. And by the way, I'm a huge VA advocate, especially in Ohio. We are so fortunate to have the five facilities and all of the CBOX that we have around here. You go to some other states, it's not that great. Here in Ohio, the VA takes great care of our veterans. 
There are a few anomalies here and there, but they take great care of their veterans. I get all of my health care at the VA, and I love it there. Absolutely love it there. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. I'd like to thank you because about three years ago when, when you knew site and everything went up, you blew my program. Everybody thought I was a big expert on veteran stuff, both of you this <coughs> In fact, I wasn't. I just went to your site and started surfing around and discovered how much was there. And people say, well, I have a veteran who needs something. Go to this place and look under this. So thank you very much for putting that up there because the more people we can send there to find resources, I think the more likely that we're going to help you get your job done. You'd be surprised at the number of veterans that surface needing help and will say, have you ever heard of a county veteran service office or our office or have you ever gone to the VA? Their answer is, no, I didn't know it existed. So that really, connectivity is the key. If you can get a veteran connected, they'll be taken care of. I think I'm out of time, and I, and I think that might have been the last question. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. thank you so much for your remarks, and thank you to all the Columbus Rotarians that have served our country as veterans, and the guests you brought today on what is the first officially called Bring your veteran to Rotary today. Do have a few announcements. Uh, we do not meet next Monday, week from today, in observance of the holiday for veteran services. We do meet two weeks from today for a special uh, visitor, the past Rotary International President, John Germ, who concluded in June of 17, is from Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's coming up, and on Monday, November 19th, we have a reception at 11 o'clock, meet and greet with him then he'll be our guest speaker two weeks from today on Monday, November 19th. He has been a Rotarian the majority of his life and continues to serve in Rotary. This is a special visit. Uh, as I've shared before, T.D. Griley, my friend of 55 years plus since I was knee high, reached out to get John to come because Scott Brown and I just felt John just has a tremendous passion and stories to share about Rotary. He's particularly passionate about polio. At the Atlanta convention that many of us attended, we raised about another billion dollars of pledges. We need 1.5. We've already spent collectively as a world 1.5 to eradicate polio, and that's part of his message two weeks from now. Nelson French couldn't be with us uh, last week or this week. We'll also be giving remarks as he was the district governor 30 years ago when the Polio Plus campaign was initiated. Tomorrow is election day, and I think how appropriate following our own Rotary's Bring Your Veteran to Rotary Day. It's a Freedom and right to vote, and one thing I read by President Ike Eisenhower in a biography I read just a year and a half ago is a new work, and he felt the presence of a very strong military was about keeping peace. Peace be with you.